Hello and welcome to Sophie & Co. I'm Sophie Shevardnadze. Today we're talking about guns. The issue of gun control divides U.S. public opinion. All too regular shooting rampages inevitably and in fierce debate over American rights. An attempt to introduce more oversight to the sale of firearms is what tooth and nail by conservatives, libertarians and champions of the Constitution. And now in a nation with one of the highest levels of gun ownership in the world, there's a new way to get hold of them, and that's thanks to 3D printers. Up to 300 million guns are in civilian possession in the US. Over 30,000 people die from firearms every year. And when shootings make world headlines, many Americans question whether the freedom to be armed is worth the freedom to be killed. Is the right to carry arms crucial to being American? Or is it the nation's curse? Are guns guarding freedom or putting the innocent in danger? Cody Wilson, the man behind the design of the first ever functioning 3D printed gun. Cody, it's really great to have you on our show today. So just in a nutshell, why did you make this gun? Oh, uh, Sophie, thank you. The gun was, I guess, a, a really great and, and visual example of political thought practice. We didn't just want to talk about the way we imagine the future. We wanted to kind of invent that future and then project it into the Internet and have the world deal with it. But then, you know, I'm thinking, obviously, you wanted to shake things up, but there are so many other ways to shake things up. Like, why a gun? Why like, you could have done anything. You could have made a 3D printable, affordable pacemaker, for example. Mm. <laughs> One, I'm not thinking about product design, consumers, uh, you know, like productivity, demand. I'm, I'm not interested in creating a product to be consumed. I'm interested in, again, like changing the coordinates of certain political realities. One of them that's close to my heart and the, the hearts of my partners uh, is the gun, uh, the gun issue in America, specifically in America. It was, you know, conceived in in the United States where we did it, uh, at a time where the United States government was thinking about banning assault weapons and uh, further restricting the ownership of firearms in, in society. We thought, you know what, we can be more effective than politicians in a certain degree. We can even blunt the paradigm by publishing the plans to uh, an infinitely replicable gun on the internet. And so we thought, okay, instead of becoming a politician or voting or doing the traditional forms of, uh, of these conceived forms of political a action, we could just attack uh, instead of instead of certain things in any other way. But so I understand the whole notion of the liberator is from from what I understand is to undermine the power of governments, the establishment to democratize things, right? So tip off the balance basically give more power to people versus the state. But then what you get at the end of the day, I mean one of the consequences is that you're labeled one of the most dangerous men in the world. When you're getting into that thing, uh, were you thinking about that at all? Were you ready for that? Well, it, I mean, it kind of happened in reverse, actually. I mean, in December of 2012, Wired Magazine named me one of these dangerous people. I mean, this was while I was just talking about printing a gun, right? I mean, uh, I didn't print the gun for almost almost six, seven months later. Um, honestly, the, the thing for us is, um, yes, there's this, we, we named it the Liberator. There's a bit of historical poetry there. But when you, when you do a bit of digging, um, it's a wartime psychological operation. What we thought the Liberator was at, at its most essential is, is a signal of the future and of the consequences of the distribution of digital manufacture. Uh, it's not necessarily that um, a, a gun-specific project. I mean, I've, I've often talked about defense distributed as not even being a gun project. Really, it's a kind of blunt way of demonstrating the anarchist potentialities uh, of distributed manufacture and digital manufacture. Right, but we're talking right now about a gun project, which gives the whole notion a particular edge, I would say. Is the society ready for the liberation <laughs> you're bringing it to? I mean, don't you, maybe you're a bit ahead of your times, don't you think? Because I'm thinking like regular folks are for the most part uneasy about the possibility of anyone making a deadly weapon at home. Do you know what I mean? Uh, I think most, yeah, I, but I think most people are apolitical and their opinions aren't really aren't even worth counseling, you know, I mean, and in fact, like, it's not consequential whether they're comfortable or uncomfortable with what uh, certain people, certain activists do. I mean, most people just abide. So we're interested in pushing at the margins of technology, at the margins of politics in, in this environment that we believe is somewhat post-political. The United States, as like a, as a warfare surveillance state, has an, has an oppressively strong Cold War era regulatory export apparatus, uh, among other things. It wants to manage the internet. It wants to spy on every government. It wants to, you know, it wants to have every partner in the world bend a knee. And we believe, you know what, uh, that's not the only role, that's not the only player in society. There are other ways to do 
political projects. But is your project only applicable to the United States? Because from, from what I understand, anyone who downloads that program can print a 3D gun. For example, in Europe, where I grew up, people right, aren't right. really pro-gun. I mean, you know, in England, for instance, where you often are, even policemen don't carry guns. They have batons. Do you know what I mean? So it's something really revolutionary no, and contradictory believe me, believe for me, them. I know. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, the, the, the project if at first couldn't get any traction in the U.S. because the, there's a, a level of comfort, a, a much higher level of comfort with guns in society. And so the only kind of a, attention we were getting was from like the German press, the U.K. press, you know, the Guardian, the Telegraph, uh, and of course some Russian press as well. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a much more jarring thing to these European populations, especially Western Europe, and it's kind of, um, uh, you know, late democratic, uh, I don't know, convalescence or something. Um, I think, though, that it, it demonstrates the points a little bit better. Uh, it doesn't even matter if there's a social or political consensus. There will be guns in these societies, and it's just a kind of intense way to demonstrate that. Uh, this is either something you can adjust to um, or something you can prepare for against even harder, but the consequences and the, and the means and ways to do that become much more more oppressive uh, and restrictive. But when you say that this is this notion of liberator is something beyond politics, um, it still creates a society with no control. How can that work? Oh it's no, very, very much. Like this is the big, I think one of the big axes of debate for the future going forward. Will there be managed and planned economies in the way that we've traditionally conceived them, uh, like in the early 21st century or the late 20th? Social control is something that I think is less achievable, especially as the means of production, both cultural and material, uh, are distributed to, m to most of us, to the common man. How can you have programs of mass, especially manufacturing control or distribution control, or just like how the personal computer came into everyone's homes, uh, anyone can become a blogger, a journalist, uh, a producer of culture. Um, there are no ways of neatly managing these strains of production anymore. And this applies to something very simple, simple articles like the firearm. How could it not? But, so I'm thinking you have studied law, right? You were first in your class, you were president of your class, and when you were like this brilliant, bright kid who got like a lot of offers from Iowa schools. But what you're practicing right now is practically the opposite of <laughs> what a law piece. would allow, right? How did that happen? Well, law and uh, law and allow are two different concepts, right? Like we have a system of laws and then we have an idea of social toleration. And so, I mean, you're asking a kind of mixed question. Um, I believe in like a, a society of laws, right? But I don't necessarily believe in a society of proscriptive, prohibitive um, checks on potential behaviors. So if someone takes a gun, let's say, and they print the, my, my liberator off and they shoot someone, it's an extremely impractical and expensive way to shoot someone. But if they do it, well then they should be dealt with as a murderer or someone who illegally owned a firearm according to a certain community's law. There doesn't need to be a kind of extra standard uh, of laws or checks or social gateways that just prevent that actor from getting the gun because the consequences uh, in the alternative um, are so bad for everyone else in society to ensure that that one person, that one actor, doesn't get the gun. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but what if, well, Cody, what if society decided that it needs checks on guns? Well, here's the question. That can we really say that society as an organism can make a kind of coherent or comprehensible decision? Uh, I don't really believe in like uh, the fictions of social contracts. I believe that's just a kind of mythology of power. That's how we explain to ourselves the fact that we elected rulers. I mean, is there such a thing as a social decision, a political consensus? No, these are fictions. They describe what's happening. They describe how power is functioning in society. And we are trying to blunt power in, in some of its mechanisms. So it's almost uh, like you're making decisions doing for the society. Maybe symbolic and psychological level. You can say that, like in the UK, they say, well, we're a gun-free society. You know, they kind of, they, they bear it with some pride, like it's, a, like it's an element of Britishness or something. Uh, and then you say, well, look, there's a gun on the internet and you can have it if they want it. That does seem to offend some type of cultural sensibility. Uh, yes, but the future is going to be like that for people. There aren't going to be regionalistic, nationalistic ways of making uh, social decisions when right. the individual has more capacity to do what he will, enabled by network or distributed technologies. Now, I've read a lot about you, and it seems like you are up for anything that is forbidden. You've even said yourself that you criticize everything. Uh, do you approve of anything at all? <laughs> it's a, 
<laughs> what's interesting, right? Like th those things that are forbidden or withheld from us. I mean, that's just an element of human curiosity, right? I can only say that <laughs> I'm just a curious romantic in that regard. I mean, what's what's worth pursuing? The things that are normally told uh, to us that we can't pursue. But I mean, they're like the the economic giants like Goldman Sachs that you don't really like, and you're sort of fighting with your idea of liberator, right? You call them banksters. Um, how exactly does your activity hurt them? <laughs> I mean, do they even know that you exist? How are you hurting them? How are you fighting with no, Liberator? No, I'm sure not. Well, I'm sure in some, I've, I've, seen, I've seen like investor newsletters where they talk about 3D printing and they might reference the Liberator. But no, there's not a, there's not a kind of direct uh, action way that we're like fighting Goldman Sachs. Although we're, we're critical of organizations like this. The kind of, um, there's a milieu in America, it's like a too big to fail, right? That there need to be institutional providers of liquidity and credit that supplement the business cycle and help America as an economic giant stay strong. They use this kind of nationalistic patriotism, you know, to kind of keep the little man uh, dominated. But I don't think these commercial banks and these players and these like, largely like these, um, oh, you know, the robber baron 2.0 systems, like I don't believe that they're necessary for the functioning of a, of a thriving, um, I don't know, neo-America. Um, am I doing anything directly to kind of undermine them? Maybe with our Bitcoin project, but this is an interview about 3D guns, and so uh, off topic. Yeah, we'll get to Bitcoin in some other interview. We're going to take a short break now. We'll be back with Hody uh, Wilson, the man who bought the world the first 3D printing gun, and we'll talk about gun control and responsibility that comes with freedom. Stay with us, guys. tolerance is the idea that for a particular misbehavior, the schools will have uh, no discretion. Personally, I think it's a foolish idea. The United States has um, a prison industry, and it's not just the government, but we have private companies that are huge and make a lot of money. Kids literally get a ticket for chewing gum in class or for um, talking too loudly, and they then have to go to court. It just seems like we have over-criminalized things, and then we have over-responded uh, disproportionately to, to, to things that even should be crime. We can push them out, put them in prison, they will get out, and they will have learned nothing. dreamt of a land in which life should be better, richer, fuller, for everyone, with opportunity for each, according to ability or achievement. They should have been welcomed as heroes. I came home, there was no follow-up call, there was no check to see if I was okay, my insurance had been cancelled. They had to begin a new battle, in their very own country. I lost the sight of my left eye, three-fourths of my right, and I lost my left leg. They have no status. They're not military, they don't have rank, they're not in uniform, they are looked upon as slaves. Right from the sea. First rate news and eye-gripping pictures. On our reporters' Twitter and Instagram. To be in the know, follow us online.
on TVs. This is RT, and we're a propaganda bullhorn. Propaganda bullhorn. That is the state-sponsored Russia Today program. Just words, but that should be enough, right? I don't think I'm going to analyze this further. That is just ridiculous. Not answer to my question. Uh Oh, Johnny's not happy. Happy. Reporters risk their safety and sometimes their lives all over the world to bring people stories non-propaganda channels don't want you to see. And we cover both sides. Your friend posts a photo from a vacation you can't afford. Comment indifferently. Your boss repeats the same old joke. Of course you like it. Your ex-girlfriend still pens tear-jerking poetry. Keep calm. Ignore it. We post only what really matters. Add RT to your Facebook newsfeed. With Cody Wilson, the man who created a 3D printer blueprint of a functioning handgun. Wow. Um, now, everything that you're describing to me, talking to me about uh, democracy and your ideas of why the Liberator should be out there, it seems like that you don't even support the concept of democracy, right? You're more of an anarchist. I'm, I'm, I'm critical of it. If people want to, if people want to live in like a democratic society or, or organization, you, more power to them. Free association is a beautiful thing, but uh, as as especially Western uh, late capitalist democracies are concerned. No, these are like oppressive superstructures which are leading toward autocracy and relative totalization uh, in terms of state power. Right, but then what is your ideal world? How would you change the system except in America you will be just arming everybody who's already armed because <laughs> everyone has a gun in America. So how, how would you change the system? <laughs> I, know. I know there's a kind of like... <laughs> <laughs> There's an ennui about it, right? It's uh, again, defense distributed isn't about personal armament. I mean, the the best first thing you can do to get a gun or arm yourself isn't to download that Liberator. Uh, the Liberator is kind of like um, the right flyer uh, of a of an alternative future, like a alternatively conceived. It wasn't supposed to happen, says the progressive. You know, <laughs> well, how did this how did this come to be? Um, no, the point, I guess, my my alternative would just be balkanization. Um, there's an American concept called federalism, which is the idea that like uh, distribution, smaller centers of power, lead to better outcomes. Just socially speaking, um, not even politically speaking. Here, if uh, if there can be smaller petty tyrants instead of larger, huh, fewer so tyrants, tribal culture. this is a better outcome uh, for the common man. <laughs> not not tribalism directly. Okay, that, 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 the connotations there are a bit like jingoistic or something. Um, but literally that. Um, Government is better at smaller municipal levels rather than a state level, better at a state level than at a federal level. Do you know what I mean? But Yeah, but could it, wouldn't, wouldn't it be like going backwards to history? Because we all started as tribal societies and we've progressed into federal and feudal societies. <laughs> so wouldn't it be like regressing well, back okay. to so the past? One. <laughs> well, who's to say we haven't regressed already? I look around at the economic situation today and, th and think to myself, hmm, isn't this kind of like Marxist feudalism or something? I mean, am I not really just a serf of some type of moneyed class? <laughs> I mean, I just have better, like, I don't know, entertainment. Uh, I can watch Game of Thrones, but am I not still dominated in some sense? <laughs> but, but to take that joke away, or like, and to be, I guess, a bit more serious, um, the idea that you're projecting is, is ideological, that there is a certain linear history to the uh, progress, that that history is kind of moving in stages of development. I'm seeing nothing but, uh, from my perspective, a train in perpetual derailment, retrograde, uh, abuses of, of liberties, and that there is no concept of real human rights. It's just something we use to go, like, bomb Iraq or, like, uh, take over a country or assert our economic dominance. I'm seeing, like, uh, a slide toward barbarism, not toward civilization that you're, that you're implying. I'm doing everything I can to maintain the distance that separates us and keep our, like, our, our humanity as individuals. Among those things like, that I think is essential is maintaining the capacity for self-preservation and ideological conflict. The Liberator is, a, I think, a great prop in that conversation. Well, you always talk about the Liberator uh, as a concept, uh, as if it wasn't like a concrete thing that you can actually print out and hold and put in action. So I'm going to talk about it as a, as a concrete thing. It's called the Liberator for a reason, like you've said. Who has it liberated so far? <laughs> uh, 
it's it's called liberator, so you can use the verb. It can it can be a liberating device. I mean, you can use it to kill someone. Uh, you can also use it to you know begin a discursive practice or free your mind. You know what I mean? I don't mean to be all like Tim Leary for you here, but uh, basically. I, uh, the question is, is, is kind of a bait. Has it liberated someone from a, a culture? No. I mean, especially as, as we traditionally conceive how liberation functions uh, in the modern world. No, it hasn't been used to overthrow governments or, you know, like, in using a terrorist act against, you know, some kind of, like, rogue state. No, that hasn't happened. Uh, but, it, yes, it is a real thing. I just shot them this morning with uh, National Geographic, you know? I mean, uh, it sparks, you know, it's a living, breathing, like, mechanism, you know? Like, uh, it, all, it, it shudders, it almost breaks, you know? I mean, it's... Uh, Yes, it's a real gun. It functions. It's a very physical thing. Uh, but its potentialities, like what's exciting about it, what grips you and, and, and seizes the imagination, is not its raw physicality, but it's everything that it suggests. Yeah, the potentiality blows my mind personally. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, are you ready to go to prison for your ideas and ideals? Uh, I, have, like, I have no need to be a martyr. Um, if it needs to be some kind of like, oh, are you principled enough to you know stand when they tell you to denounce what you believe and go to jail? You know, that's not happening. And I'm, I don't intend to go to jail. And, and people practicing in this space, the kind of digital libertarian radical space, they're often going to jail and faced with that proposition. I mean, a lot of the Bitcoin radicals, um, uh, let's see, Ross Ulbricht of the Silk Road, the largest online drug marketplace. These people are starting to pay the piper. The United States government is coming down hard. I think to be an activist successfully in the long term, you have to still act within the legal framework that the United States or other countries right. give you. But, but um, I guess but what I'm asking... you've got to push the envelope and you I have to take risks. I guess what I'm asking, Cody, sorry. I guess what I'm asking is that are you ready to, you know, to follow the examples of Assange and Snowden, for example? I mean, they did what they did for the greater good of the society. Well, Oh, no, I know. I know. Oh, well, it's great that we agree with that. I believe that Snowden and Assange both did what they did for the greater good, and that the world they is a better also, place. They, they were also they were ready to, to entail the consequences. I believe so. Well, it depends on who you ask, right? Senator Dianne Feinstein would say Snowden's a coward for running as a fugitive of justice, therefore not accepting the responsibility of what he did by not facing American justice back at home. You and I both know that that's a lie and that he did a brilliant thing by becoming a fugitive and using the power of the Russian government and the, these geopolitical tensions to harbor himself and continue to kind of be an advocate and representative of what he revealed. So are you, are uh, you ready to, to be, be an advocate for, for, for what you revealed? States. I, I believe I am a, a somewhat forceful advocate of what I've done and revealed and, and uh, am continuing to do, uh, especially in the Bitcoin space. I don't believe I have to become a fugitive from justice to do that. I don't believe I necessarily have to overtly break laws to do that. I believe that our legal structure is so so great, so large, in the United States especially, so entangled that there are all these pressure points and contradictions and things to exploit that don't require you to just kind of overtly break a law and risk going to jail. Mm -hmm. But when I'm thinking 3D gun printing, surely in America that too will ultimately be regulated, no? I'm, I'm sure to some degree, but it depends on what you mean. I mean, gun manufacture and gun possession in the U.S. are actually well-regulated activities already. This is the frustration that a lot of these politicians are now encountering. They would like to regulate 3D printing of guns, <laughs> except the problem is they want to regulate the technology first as just a general technology. And they're, they're like, oh, right, that would be tyrannical. And so they're not finding a neat way of doing it. It's like saying, I can take my computer uh, and I can create a certain kind of like verboten object, and then a politician saying, you know, we really ought to regulate how people use their computers. That's pretty tough to do in the end. But I'm thinking, once again, there are so many guns in the U.S. already, and they're so easy to get. What's the big deal about the 3D printing guns, then? Uh, I guess I'll answer that in, in two ways. At first, uh, I'm with you, actually. The kind of uh, the gun community in America was like, what's the deal? It's an inferior product. It's not as good as what I can go buy at Walmart. You know, what's this project about? And it took them until um, these politicians, after the Sandy Hook massacre in the United States, started thinking about regulating certain gun articles, like magazines and rifle receivers. We started replicating these uh, quite cheaply and then putting the files online, and people realized, oh, I get it. It's a kind of like, it's a kind of backstop. It's a kind of backup. It's an insurance scheme against the oppressive regulation of certain gun components. Uh, so that's really seized the American public's attention, the American gun owning public's attention. And then the second level thing is to suggest that distributed manufacturing means five years 
years from now, I'll be able to make all kinds of multi-material strange things that haven't existed yet, in, in ways that haven't been conceived yet. And so like, uh, it's a kind of paradigm breaker. The, your progressive gun control advocate in the United States actually relies upon strong American gun companies because those are the, lo like the, the focus centers of gun regulation. If everyone in every home could become a gun manufacturer, gun control is dead with or gun control. But do you feel the pressure from the government already for breaking that paradigm? Uh, yeah, I, I do feel some pressure. I mean, I know we've been investigated, uh, you know, by State Department, by Department of Justice, and but what, what, what uh, these exactly are things that are you they have doing? to just assume will happen. What happens if, if a kid is killed with a gun that you made up? This is also responsibility, right? I, I mean, so like, let's say uh, what I think is, is, is most likely that maybe a, maybe a kid or like a, a teenager prints it out and is testing it and doesn't test it safely and injures himself or kills himself. Let's right. say that, right? right? But again, this is just an aspect of you have, you, you're dealing with a device which is explosive and, and lethal. It can be explosive and lethal, right? There's no way of kind of permanently changing the qualities of, of that object or the potentials of the outcomes. I mean, that's what you're dealing with. There's no way of putting enough pads uh, and gates and checks in between that actor and what he's doing and the kind of like the, the pure isolation of his experience. There's no way of stopping it. And you can't kind of come back at the, at the creator and say, and, and I love this because Kalashnikov, up until his death anyway, was the same way. You know, blame the politicians for the wars. Blame the politicians for the terroristic acts, how they spread guns all over the earth. The United States State Department, for example, is very good at pushing Russian munitions, other munitions, under cover of other entities, into other like conflict zones. And many people die, including these children that we're talking about right now. We shouldn't necessarily blame the hobbyists, the inventors, the creators, the political activists, just for giving us uh, just a marginal amount of access to new technologies for some kind of marginal death, when there's a grand machinery of death all around us all the time, which we're very much to blame for by supporting it with our money and our votes. Cody, thank you very much for this interesting insight into your 3D printed gun world. It's been great talking to you. Cody Wilson, the man behind the 3D printed gun, thanks a lot for being with us. That's it for this edition of Sophie & Co. and we will see you next time.